This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I am the voice of MDH podcast, Nick Andrews, and I am joined, as I always am, by the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry. Hi, Nick. How are you? Welcome to our podcast again. I'm doing well. I just got back from covering the 2019 annual Congress of the American College of Surgeons, where I learned a lot about thoracic surgery and colorectal surgery, and we'll, we'll talk about one of those coming up a little later, but... Um, it was, it was fun where, to go out where there. Was that, where was that? California? Yes, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, not bad. The, the Moscone Center. Like Italian food, Japanese food. I, I enjoy San Francisco. And that's a great location. Yeah, they do a good meeting there. Absolutely. So this week we got a big show. Uh, we welcome back one of our favorite guests for a what our editor, Mary Ellen Schneider, called a spooky episode on post hoc analyses and how to make them not so spooky. Uh, we welcome back Dr. Schneider. He's a recurring guest. Uh, so what can we expect with the, from the interview today? Well, he's a really interesting fellow. I've come to know him over the past few, more than a few years. And um, he has this uh, knack of kind of a hobby, he calls it almost, of uh, knowing statistics. And he can dumb it down, explain it to us. And what we talk about in this episode is the post hoc analysis. So you're an investigator, you do a great big trial, and uh, you have a result come out. And you go, you know, I think this worked better in men than women. And you uh, subject in a retrospective post hoc, meaning after the fact, analysis, yeah, I think it does. But then, as he points out, not fair, because you can, by chance, have something like that turn out when you weren't prospectively analyzing for it. So we really get into, we do a few examples, get into why that's not fair. It's hypothesis generating, but not solution yielding when you think you've found something that you look at retrospectively. Sure. I guess it's just like a lot of other retrospective analyses where it is interesting, but it is just the first uh, brick in a wall of, of, of data that you need to get to make conclusions. Exactly. What it kind of does is you say, OK, this this looked really good. After the fact, we then have to go to the next trial and analyze that, which uh, this looked good in, but not conclusive in. And it generates the next trial. So that is coming up, the interview portion of our show in a little bit. And of course, don't forget to stay tuned for this week in hematology and oncology. But we want to introduce the clinical correlation segment this week, Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. She is exploring what to tell patients and how to talk to patients uh, when it comes to prognostic scoring system results. Uh, that's something that a patient's going to have access to, and we'll be able to Google and, and figure out what's going on. But how, how do you help a patient navigate something like that? Well, if you think of the common, most common oncology tumors we see in the clinic with breast, colon, lung, there are scoring systems, um, prognostic systems, maybe one of your tests. I'm thinking of some of the DNA testing done in breast cancer, a popular one, Oncotype DX, gives you a recurrent score. Well, you tell the patient the score, what's that mean? Of course, they'll Google it. Or you might um, have a myelodysplastic syndrome and you get an IPSS score and uh, it tells how likely or not likely you are to go to acute leukemia. And so this is um, hard facts, subjective, but then has to be discussed with the patient and, and uh, made relevant for that particular individual. So that's an interesting talk. I'm, I can't wait to hear what she says. Yeah, I completely agree. And she, as always, uh, Dr. Yerkowitz does a really great job of finding something interesting to talk about. But okay, it's time for this week in hematology and oncology from the ACS Clinical Congress, where I was covering my colleague Jim Kling writes, in rectal cancer, fragmented care is linked to lower survival. So this is a study uh, locally advanced rectal ca cancer fragmentation of radiotherapy and surgery comes at a cost even at academic medical centers. And this is according to data from the National Cancer Center database. Um, I guess this makes some intuitive sense, but I, I, I wonder what's, what's lying beneath here. I was thinking the same thing. It, it makes sense. You go, huh, well, if I get my radiation here and my surgery there or my chemotherapy there, rectal cancer tends to get all three. Uh, the reason I think this is believable is maybe the coordination of care is not the best. So uh, there's a little speed bump, a white count is low, and you got to pause, or the radiation uh, machine breaks for uh, one particular day, and you don't know it because we're at different places. And so I could see how that might lead to different, and in this case, as the study points out, worse outcomes. Sure. So let's take a quick look at the data. The analysis included 28,000, more than 28,000 patients between 2006 and 2015, about 17,000 of whom had integrated care. They found that uh, integrated care patients had a lower likelihood of 30-day unplanned readmission, and those with fragmented care uh, experienced higher mortality. These data were statistically significant, the hazard ratio, as Dr. Streiner would uh, explain to us. 
was 1.07, and it was statistically significant. What I found interesting was that fragmented care was more common in academic centers uh, compared with community centers, and that the, the researchers also found that performance of surgery at an academic center was a predictor of better survival. So it was better to have surgery at an academic center regardless of whether the care was fragmented or integrated, but you were more likely to have fragmented care if your surgery was at an academic institution. So I think those data are really interesting. Really interesting. So the the, um, details and reproducibility would be interesting. I can think that maybe an academic center, it's big. And so maybe coordinating the moving parts might be harder than in a smaller community center. And that's my my guesstimate of what this might be showing. Right, and of course, retrospective study comes with limitations. You can read more about the data and stories like this each and every day at mdedge.com slash hematology oncology. But without further ado, it's time to welcome back one of our favorite guests. And someone, I guess, can, could you call him Spooky? Is this an appropriate guest for Halloween? I, I think Spooky Statistics is perfect for Halloween. Spooky <laughs> Statistics. <laughs> All right, so coming up after this, Dr. David Schreiner joins Dr. David Henry, and uh, we'll be right back with Blood and Cancer. Welcome to this podcast. I'm Dr. David Henry, your host from the online journal MD Edge, where the official title is mdedge.com slash hematology dash oncology. And you're listening to the podcast we call Blood and Cancer, coming to you each week with various interviews from thought leaders around the country and the world of topics of interest we hope you find very interesting. And today we're going to do what I find very interesting and sadly very confusing that only A few people in the world understand, one of them is on the line with me now, Dr. David Streiner, Professor, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster University. David, welcome again to our podcast. It's a delight to be back. Well, we're very delighted to have you back and to once again um, take advantage of your hobby, since you always claim it's not exactly your training, in uh, statistics. And we're going to work off a nice piece that you and Jeffrey Norman did for us a few years ago and refresh it talking about a particular statistical issue that comes up not infrequently as we read our articles and try and learn and go forward called the post hoc analysis. So an after the fact analysis, and we're going to talk about two articles and what you think why this could or should or shouldn't be done. And the first one we're going to look at is Obinutuzumab, this is a New England Journal article, and it came out in 2017. If those listening want to look at it, it's October 5, issue 2017. First author, Marcus, and the title was Obinutuzumab for the First-Line Treatment of Follicular Lymphoma. This is one of our newer CD20-engineered uh, monoclonal antibodies going against B-cell lymphomas, mostly where the CD20 resides. Rituximab has been the kingpin for many years. So this was a comparison in follicular lymphoma of a rituximab-based chemotherapy versus obinutuzumab-based chemotherapy. And they found the top-line analysis said the median follow-up of 34.5 months and that they found there was a significantly lower risk of progression, relapse, or death in the people, patients who had the obinutuzumab, the, the study arm. Now, they went on to say, well, we had a post hoc analysis. And I'll Give it over to you in one second. And what is that? And in that, they said, well, "Why don't we pause right there before I tell you what they said?" They did a post hoc analysis. What is that? What does that Latin mean? In the paper, they said very explicitly what their primary analysis is, and they also said they were going to do some secondary analysis. So these were spelled out before the trial began, hopefully. Uh, in the protocol, they said what the analyses were going to uh, involve. Then once they got the data, they said, okay, we've got a lot of data. Uh, let's look at some other relationships, see if other things hold, um, using analyses that we didn't specify beforehand. And what I have to say in the paper's favor is that they are very explicit about this. Most papers aren't. Uh, but they went to great lengths to say these are the analyses that we planned, and these are the analyses that we didn't plan ahead of time. And it's those that they didn't plan ahead of time that are called the post hoc analyses. 
Right. And so I'm looking then, all right, so the postdoc means, of course, after the fact. And, you know, we I've been involved with studies where an outcome occurs and we go, wow, look at that other thing that looks like it's different. Let's make something out of that. That would be the postdoc analysis and that that carries risk. In this particular paper, they said um, based on characteristics, some stratification factors of randomization were consistent with the result and showed no evidence of heterogeneity. However, it appeared stronger in the females, in the women. They gave a hazard ratio of 0.49, did not cross one for confidence interval versus men, where the hazard ratio that the study drug worked better than rituximab, 0.82, and the confidence interval crosses one. So is that useful at all, or should we disregard it? It's useful not as a finding. All post analyses should be treated as hypotheses uh, that should be followed up in a future study, which isn't always possible. I know these studies are very difficult to mount, very expensive, but strictly speaking, this is not uh, a primary finding. It's a hypothesis based on, uh, again, post hoc look at the data and uh, should discuss why they should be looked on with some degree of suspicion. Um, earlier in the paper, they, where is it, um, on page 1334, mm-hmm. they say that they've done a total of 19 subgroup analyses, parentheses, not pre-specified. And I'm not sure whether those subgroup analyses refer to the post hoc analysis. But if they do, then if we accept the alpha level of 0.05 that we're going to find uh, findings by chance 5% of the time, then if they do 19 analyses, you expect to find one significant just by chance. And what they're reporting is one analysis that's significant. And you have to wonder, is that the one analysis that you expect to find significant by chance? Because all of the other subgroup analyses, they say, were not significant. So one out of 20, using our 0.05 level, which they refer to, might in fact be the one that's chance. So, David, is it fair to say that if we take the high road for this paper, they showed a better outcome for the study arm, the obinutuzumab versus rituximab-based chemo-based therapy in these lymphoma patients, but then when they did their post hoc analysis after the fact, which they clearly stated, they found that it seemed to be better in women than in men, and they gave us some p-values and confidence intervals, but all that should say to us is that's a great thing to study going forward and not hang your head on it looking backward. Absolutely. That's exactly what they should say. Okay. How it should be interpreted. Okay. So then I wanted to then uh, go back in time to the analysis you and Jeffrey did in a prostate cancer study, which you liked. Do you recall that enough? Do you have that in front of you and mention how you liked the study screening PSAs? But there was kind of very no nowhere near as clear as in this study that we just went through that there was a post hoc analysis. Mm-hmm. So that was by to remind us all that was by Crawford et al. 2011 Journal of Clinical Oncology JCO, and the title was "Comorbidity and Mortality Results from a Randomized Prostate Cancer Screening Trial." And the post hoc analysis said that the men with very few comorbidities already where the positive outcome of a screening trial with those with some comorbidity were not. So I think you and Jeffrey thought that was a little much and didn't agree with it. Right, right. Again, it was a post hoc analysis. And as uh, we discussed earlier, the difficulty with saying we did a, uh, an analysis and these are our results is that it doesn't say how many analyses were done and weren't reported, and realize that even if you look at the data, 
And uh, yeah, it doesn't look as if age is important. We won't bother to analyze that. You've just done an analysis. So looking at the data and deciding what you're going to do in a formal sense and which ones you're not going to bother with because they don't look promising are doing analyses. And as you just mentioned, you expect 5% of the analyses to be significant by chance. So to report one finding and not say this is based on 32 analyses or maybe just one analysis leaves the reader unsure whether it's a real finding or just cherry picking the data and looking at what looks promising. Okay, makes perfect sense to me. So I'll summarize from my non-statistical mind that we like prospective trials. We like randomized trials, so-called phase three, where arm A compares to arm B. We need our investigators and our statisticians to guesstimate where this might go and an uh, appropriate power test supplied and um, stratification, which I'll come back to in a minute, and then pre-plan any analyses and make sense out of those, but to look back after the fact, post hoc, and generate some hypotheses that might look interesting than studying going forward. So that's a fair statement. Right. Exactly. Now, stratification, I once heard an investigators say, you know, if you stratify a study enough times, you torture the data enough, it'll tell you anything. So in a pre-planned analysis, you may pick a few things, male, female, um, East Coast, West Coast. I is there... Any value to that, and can you stratify too much? Yeah. Uh, there's a debate in the literature. If you do a lot of analyses, even pre-planned, should you use a more conservative alpha level or not? And I don't think this debate is ever going to be resolved, but the best advice is just choose a few primary outcomes and uh, base your primary analyses on those and treat everything else as just hypothesis generating. Uh, don't specify too many hypotheses ahead of time. You're bound to find something. Yeah, yeah, hence torturing the data. So you might say right. we're going to choose survival, we might choose progression-free survival, and we think there's a male-female difference we think there might be a, an institutional difference, so we'll stratify maybe one, two things. Of course, depending on our numbers, if it's a 10-patient yeah. study, it's not going to work. If it's a 1,000-patient study, it might work. So that, that would work going forward with a few stratifications, post hoc analysis, simply hypothesis generating. Right, exactly. I think we've tortured the subject um, enough <laughs> in, in this uh, occasional and not often enough, in my opinion, visit from you and statistics. I want to refer the readers. I mentioned the follicular lymphoma article we critiqued and we liked. And I want to refer you to something written by David Streiner and his partner in crime and statistics, Jeffrey Norman, in 2011. And this is in the August 2011 issue of Community Oncology, which you can find online to read and review exactly how they dissect this really interesting thing of post hoc analysis. Be careful how much you make out of it. So I'll thank you again, talking to Dr. David Streiner, who comes to us from McMaster, and I hope you'll listen to Blood and Cancer online. This will be posted with the show notes from what we just said and the references also for you to read that I referred to with their URLs, their, their web addresses at mdedge.com slash hematology-oncology. And David, certainly thank you again for being available. We look forward to another one in the near future. I hope so. We'll get back to you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Dr. Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. Today, I want to talk about prognostic scoring systems. What I'm talking about are these incredible tools developed usually by physicians based on large databases we have of patient outcomes. From these databases, we have been able to better predict how a patient will fare 
based on certain characteristics, things like age, functional status, and also molecular and genetic abnormalities unique to their cancer. These are great tools for doctors to help think about realistic treatment options. What I still struggle with, though, is when to share this information with patients. We are taught, correctly, I think, not to give just one number when talking about prognosis. For example, don't say something like six months to live. Because the reality is the range is broad and we cannot predict how any given person will do. It's irresponsible to hide information, but it's also irresponsible to be so granular when we really are unsure. And so what to do with these scoring systems? They do often result in something like one number. Time to progression on average, for example, three years. Is this information too granular to share with patients? Is it withholding not to? It may sound like a cop-out, but I truly believe it depends. It depends a lot on the person and how they process information, and it depends on how well the doctor can share it. I don't think it's incorrect to share this type of granular information with people, as long as it's qualified and counseled in detail, and as long as we recognize our own humility in making predictions. They are averages, they can be helpful, and they can be guides, but they're not sure things. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll tune in next time for Clinical Correlation. And that's a wrap on episode 42 of Blood and Cancer. It's time now for the credits. Blood and Cancer is hosted by the Editor-in-Chief of MDH Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry. The Clinical Correlation segment is written, recorded, and produced by Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. Blood and Cancer is produced by Editor Mary Ellen Schneider. All of MDH podcasts are produced by Executive Editors Denise Fulton and Kathy Scarbeck, MDH Multimedia Editor Terry Rudd. Our social media is produced by Kyla Clark, and I am your audio editor, audio engineer, and the voice of MD Edge Podcasts, Nick Andrews. Thanks for joining us for episode 42 of Blood and Cancer. Mm-hmm.